So again, uh, well, welcome everyone. And I am Arne van Alstenfjord and I'm the global head of the KCS Academy. And welcome to our KCS in Action featuring coaching. And uh, we're very fortunate to have three uh, very experienced KCS practitioners on our coaching panel. And uh, we have Monique Kadina, Christy Morin, and Jason O'Donnell. And they're gonna discuss their coaching programs, uh, tips to get started, ditches to avoid, and how they measure and sell the value. And what's been nice is as we've been having some pre-meetings, they each implemented coaching differently. So you get a broad perspective on the options. But some housekeeping before we begin, uh, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the KCS Academy site as well as sent out to all who have registered. And um, please post your questions in chat. So the way we're gonna do this, I'll be monitoring the chat. I'm gonna bring them up to the panels appropriate in the flow uh, or save them for the Q&A session at the end. But we should have plenty of time for questions throughout. And what the panel has volunteered to do any questions that we don't answer in this session, uh, we will have the chat log and we'll actually answer those and uh, uh, send that out with the recording. And so while you're not speaking, please put yourself on mute. Um, and also wanna make sure you're aware of upcoming KCS Academy events. So on December 8th, uh, Richie Adams and Richie uh, Macchio from ADP will discuss how they leverage Scrum and Agile in their KCS program. And it's not only for the tools and features, but for the entire KCS um, methodology deployment. And this KCS in action was rescheduled from the summer. So please ensure if you registered previously that it shows correctly on your calendar again, December 8th. And Jennifer Mortcat, our community success manager, will be posting the link uh, in the chat for that event. And it's always great to hear about uh, digital transformations happening within the community. And I say digital transformation, certainly we do a lot of KCS um, transformations, but community, um, intelligence warming, any digital transformation that you'd like to share, and whether it be the successes, strategies, and tips, uh, as well as ditches people encountered and how to avoid them. So if you'd like to present at a KCS in action or be part of a, a future panel, we're gonna be doing more and more of these panel discussions, um, please reach out to me and we'll get you on the calendar. And I'm gonna post my contact information in chat. But I'm uh, very excited about today's event. So let's get started. And let's start with uh, introducing our panel. And let's start with Christy. All right, thank you, Ivan. We are really excited to be here with you today. So thank you for the opportunity. And thank you all for joining. So you may know Broadcom due to our market presence. With 24 billion in revenues, we have a major presence in numerous markets. We have 23 category leading divisions or what we call business units that we commonly describe as either semiconductor or infrastructure groups. With that, we recently created a dedicated group called Broadcom Software last week as we rang the NASDAQ bell last week. Very exciting times. So this group is, is committed to building a comprehensive portfolio of industry-leading enterprise software that will enable innovation, stability, scalability, and security. We have one of the largest IP portfolios with over 20,000 patents, and everything we do at Broadcom is framed around technology leadership. So I'm the program manager of the KCS program here for Broadcom Software. And I've been honored to lead this program since the acquisition of CA Technologies in 2008 and for numerous years before that. I'm also proud to be KCS version six certified as well. So we are really busy here in software with over a thousand current supported products, bringing in over 22,000 cases a month. Our support team is naturally responsible for our knowledge base articles. And we have about 125,000 knowledge base articles that are published. We offer the standard suite of omni-channel options, such as a support site with federated search, um, a chatbot to live agent chat, and product communities. <clears throat> now, the focus of today, we have about 112 coaches that oversee or represent our 750 knowledge workers. And roughly of that, 25% are still authors. In our program, we also have about 45 KDEs that represent some of our highest volume products. So getting started, that sums it up for me. Um, let's hear about what Jason is up to at Autodesk. Jason, over to you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Christy. My name is Jason O'Donnell, and I am the KCS Program Manager at Autodesk. At Autodesk, we make technology that millions of people use to design and make the world around us. Our solutions are used to create all kinds of amazing things, from the greenest buildings to the cleanest cars, from the smartest factories to the biggest blockbuster movies. And our platform helps our customers combine technologies to solve their challenges, whatever their industry. While relatively new to the Autodesk world, I've actually been involved with KCS for the past decade plus in various roles with my prior company's support organization. And in fact, uh, Christy, I just got my visa certification this past October. So uh, fun little uh, tidbits there that you can still do this without the visa certification, but I guarantee you that cert uh, takes you far. Uh, our current KCS program provides support for about 100 products across a number of different delivery channels. With just around 360 knowledge workers, we have about 37 coaches and 10 leads to help mentor and guide along the way. About one third of our staff are actually authorized to publish content publicly. And then we have another 10 product aligned KDEs that generate deeper insights and more complex content along the way as well. Likewise, with about uh, 230,000 articles, uh, we do have our knowledge work cut out for us in terms of content lifecycle management and evolve loop efforts as well. And with those relevant details out of the way, Monique, why don't you tell us a bit about your program at Akamai? Sure. Hi, I'm the global KCS program owner for Akamai. And I've also been designated as an innovator by the Consortium for Service Innovation for my contributions to the evolution of KCS and part of that included coaching programs. I have over 20 years experience with KCS support sites, communities and change management. Akamai, who I work for, is a global cybersecurity and edge services company trusted by the world's leading brands. Our mission is to power and protect life online. And our purpose is we make life better for billions of people, billions of times a day. Our support organization that is doing KCS consists of about 500 employees. We offer technical support for customers and partners via agent assist, chat, and self-service. And in addition to the 500 knowledge workers or engineers, there are about 150 outside of support that have grown our program organically. So they started in support, um, but then they moved on to other teams and they kept their KCS license and continued to participate. We have about 6,000 articles that are external um, that accounts for about 30% of our knowledge base. We have 127 coaches. And so that is a combination of 20 lead coaches and then the remaining KCS coaches. And then additionally, we have 33 KDEs. All right. Well, I'm sure people were um, calculating you know, the coach to knowledge worker ratio as, as you're introducing yourself. So let's drill down on your individual coaching programs. So Christy, you want to lead us off there? Yeah, sure. So at Broadcom, like I previously mentioned, we have about 112 coaches that reign one to six, right? So one coach to six. Um, company people. So coaches um, in our environment are responsible for AQIs, which is the article quality index, um, <clears throat> as well as PAR, the process adherence review, or um, what you might know as PII, or you might also know as link accuracy. So we expect coaches to do AQIs and link accuracy checks. So coaching us is left to the discretion of the coach as being formal and informal. So what I mean by that is that the tool that we use will automatically notify the person who's being coached that a review was done, if it being an AQI or link accuracy, and the person who did that review is copied on it, but it's up to the discretion of the coach of how they discuss the, the future feedback. I mean, maybe it's a standing one-on-one, -on -one, maybe they drop by their cube if they're in the local, so maybe they call them, or maybe they have a chat session or maybe there's no other um, need to follow up on that. So it's up to the discussion. We don't log that or, or monitor that um, activity. So it's a, it's a little bit more informal here. One to four hours a week as a coach. So this depends on the maturity of the team and the coach to the knowledge worker ratio, right? So if you have a more mature team or if you have 
um, more publishers and authors, you might not spend as much time as if you had all authors, per se. So to help put some guidelines on getting started with what we expect you to do as a coach, we set some targets. And so, or I would say minimum requirements, if I will. So what we have looking for is a three link accuracies a month per the person that you're coaching. Um, and also three AQIs or content standard checklist as they're now um, referred to um, a quarter per the person you're coaching for that who is a publisher, right? And of course, if you're an author, you should be reviewing and doing an AQI on all of those for that, that individual. So again, this is the minimum that we're using right now. Um, in the past, we've done exercises to, to get a baseline assessment where for three months, if you do 15 reviews, their link accuracy is per, per um, person you're coming over three months to give you a good period of time to complete that work in. And then you just manage outlier management going forward. So I do still think that that is a good approach. Um, but where we're at now, we're just to get restarted with this as we reintroduced this recently um, back into our tool and our workflow. Um, we just have the minimum set and then coaches are seeing on their own that they might need to more or less based on the maturity of the team. Um, we also with this, uh, for our support of our coaches, we have monthly KCS team calls. Um, they include the coaches and the KDEs and friends of the KCS program or people who just wanna stay informed. We also do a monthly calibration call um, for either the AQI or link accuracy. And we can do those together so people can see how we're thinking and, and um, evaluating uh, content and have discussions around those. So those are really great. We also have a Slack channel just for the KCS team, uh, as well as emails that we all use to collaborate with our coaches and KDEs. Monique, what about your program at Akamine? Well, like yours, it's also based off of maturity um, of the knowledge worker and also the coach. So, um, you know, depending on how much, how mature they are is it, really going to uh, depend on how much time they, they spend. So a, a new coach is obviously going to spend more time. Um, a seasoned coach with the new employee is going to obviously spend more time. But on average, what we're finding is that um, it's anywhere from two to four hours per week. And the coaches are peer coaches. So they're, they, they are uh, fellow knowledge workers. So they really understand the workflow. And um, the goal that we've set for them is to really have at least four coaching sessions a month. Now that is also based off maturity. So if you are a candidate or contributor, we want you to have about four sessions a month. Now, if you're a publisher where you're more mature and you've already demonstrated those skills, um, we, we've made that two sessions a month. And so we also set an OKR, which is an objectives and key result target on that. And so the, the idea is that we want people to attend 75% of their coach, coaching sessions throughout the year on average. And during the coaching sessions, they do things like a content standard checklist, which is formerly the AQI. Uh, they also do linking accuracy checks and they review PAR, uh, which we don't fully structure in a mathematical table as shown in the practices guide, uh, because I found that it's often distracts people. And so instead our dashboard is set up so that coaches can see all of their assigned coaches activity on one page. So it's pretty easy to tell who might need some extra help and who's doing well uh, without explaining or unpacking the contribution index. And so lastly, our linking checks also, um, those also have an OKR of 20% of cases. So we want, you know, the average throughout the year to be 20% of cases are checked for linking accuracy. Um, so that's, that's our uh, coaching process in a nutshell. Um, Jason, what about you? How does that compare to your program? Well, with our coaching staff at 37, Monique, <clears throat> we have an additional 10 leads as well. We actually average a one to eight ratio of our coach to support specialist, though we do have support specialists without coaches as well. We also run a weekly open office hours that helps to cover anyone who may have questions around reviews or uh, other general coaching concerns. 
And we have dedicated coach KDE and even a KCS council Slack channel, as well as a more broadly general KCS Slack channel that helps in our communication across the organization in an asynchronous manner. We generally try to target about five cases per specialist per month for review for both the content standard and the process adherence review or PAR. Uh, our review process actually spans our global teams. So our coaches aren't actually reviewing their own team's cases. They take from a queue and uh, are able to review cases from teams outside of their own. Uh, that really helps to bring in some more objectivity to the process. I'm also working on a future strategy here that uh, will further centralize our reviews and reduce some of that effort for our coaching teams as well. Our reviews are all case triggered, but also include content reviews in that same process, which does lead us to a fairly heavy lift for our coaches to review, especially when balancing that time with delivering those outcomes to their coachees. And that said, we all benefit from a large commitment of time here. So our coaches tend to average about 14 hours a week in their coaching duties to both review and deliver, which comes out to about a 35% time commitment. Uh, it is a, a fairly heavy time commitment there, but uh, we have found that the more time you put in, uh, the more results you get back out. And uh, I am definitely looking, uh, like I said, in my future strategy to further centralize that and hopefully reduce the amount of time given to reviews and increase the amount of time given to actual coaching of the, the support specialists. And with that, I think uh, it takes it back to you, Arnfin. Yeah, great. And uh, so thank you all. And I, I remember coming back from uh, a meeting with Autodesk over a year ago um, to discuss the coaching program and uh, having someone different doing the assessment uh, than the one coaching the person was an aha moment for me. And I remember uh, meeting shortly afterwards with Greg Oxton and I brought up this practice. I said, oh, we should get that in the practices guide. And, and Greg Conley responded that the practices, uh, that practice was already documented in the practices guide as a recommendation. So uh, great on that. And a uh, lot of great questions already in chat. And we're going to get to many of those. So the only one that we're not going to get to that I thought we'd address right now. So uh, they're asking what tools you use. And I believe uh, that Autodesk and Akamai use are both using Salesforce. And then um, Chris to use uh, uh, Vulcan at um, at, uh, at Broadcom. Yes, at we Broadcom, use Vulcan yeah. software. Okay, and then but we do we will get to the other questions. So let's actually jump into. We talked about some of the best practices um, as far as how to to set this up, but let's uh, drill down into tips for an effective coaching program. And many of the questions that are coming up in chat, we're going to actually hit on uh, this slide. So uh, do you want to lead us off on this, Jason? Excellent. Absolutely, Arnfin. Thank you. Uh, now that we've gone over the numbers of our programs, of course, uh, let's cover some of those key tips that our three companies actually came together and found were in common for establishing an effective coaching program. Uh, obviously, the first one here, starting small, of course, absolutely in line with the KCS V6 practices. It's a time-tested method for ensuring quality experiences. Smaller teams, of course, allow for more focused adoption and capabilities to identify and address issues earlier in a small environment. An easy way to do this is to actually start with the people that are passionate about knowledge sharing and eager to join in. Leveraging this energy absolutely helps to invigorate others. But we don't want to forget to include our managers for those selected teams from the get-go. Making sure that the managers are fully bought in now helps to ensure your longer-term success and actually reduces those roadblocks later on. Likewise, allowing your coaches to own the program while you provide guidance helps steer them away from those pitfalls and road bumps. This ownership likely comes with some lively discussion as well. So we wanna make sure to really listen and embrace those resistors. They're giving you gold in those conversations. We may have missed out on that, that gold uh, if we had simply directed and dictated the methods. We need to, to sit back and listen a little more closely to what they're saying and what they're not saying. These two next bullets, they're somewhat related. Making sure our teams have the tools necessary to accomplish their goal with as few speed bumps as possible is crucial to adoption. The harder we make it for our teams, the less likely we are to actually see them embrace that change. 
In, in part, this spreads into communications. Using multiple channels to continue to hit that KCS drumbeat, but be sure to, to tailor that messaging to each channel and audience. I generally like to frame this as having the right tool for the right conversation. Each channel has its strong points, so make sure to leverage those strengths and point to other locations when the conversations need to move. This should also help you align globally as you work asynchronously across the right communications channels. But we don't wanna miss the opportunity here to meet directly with all of our geographies to ensure that their perspectives are both heard and addressed. Relying purely on the asynchronous communications tends to engender a siloed perspective and feeling. So we wanna be sure to do those direct calibrations with the teams that helps us detect and avoid regional shifts and differences. Aligning globally and specific, specifically calibrating globally helps all of your teams feel like they're being treated equally and with deeper ownership in the overall process. Lastly, fail fast and fail often. Being nimble in this respect will help you to identify areas that aren't working before they become larger problems. These iterative improvements, especially as we start small, all help to fine tune the program and avoid those larger pitfalls as you roll out more broadly. And Monique, Christy, I know, know both of you probably have some additional insights here, so uh, I'd love to hear your perspectives. Yeah, nicely said, Jason. Um, and I think you hit a lot of it on the head. Just a few comments. Um, so one, when you mentioned about listen, you know, to what the coaches are saying and also like what they're not saying um, and take action. So your team needs to see that their leader of this program can actually, um, they can trust you to, to listen and accept their feedback and take action. Now, granted, technology changes might take some time, but there might be some small wins that you can take in the meantime about processes um, or workflow, or at least making sure that you're following up on what you said you would do. Um, making sure that your team sees you as a trusted advisor and le leader is so critical. And it kind of leads me to my next point, which is building your network. We don't have all the answers, right? As a program leader, sometimes like, what should I do? Or what is the best course of action? And I can guarantee you there are no right or wrong answers. Um, sometimes it's getting perspective of how other people are doing it, like the reason we're having this, this webinar today. Um, and making the best decision for the environment that you're in with what you have and how to get started. Um, because KCS is an iterative improvement. But to the point of building your network, um, coming to events like this, connecting on LinkedIn, using the LinkedIn um, KCS group are all ways that you can um, get to know other practitioners. And when you have a question, you can ask them. Um, I do it all the time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just the other day, Jason and, and Monique and I were just discussing archive strategies. So definitely um, keeping those relationships and making those relationships is, is helpful. And pre-COVID, uh, the member annual summits were a great way to make those face-to-face -face introductions. So that's a possibility in the future. Um, and lastly, um, you know, Jason, to your point, welcome the resistors. So they aren't fighting you. They're trying to tell you that something is not working well. So. For instance, um, we had a situation at Broadcom where the way that we calculate link rate was just closed cases and if you had something linked. And um, we got some feedback from some engineers. And so um, rather than fight it and just say this is the way it is, I tried to really understand, met with the manager, which is to really understand what was going on. And so what we found is that there was a certain type of case type, um, what we call proactive, found is that um, in our workflow and in our methodology, those were never really good candidates for KB. It wasn't a self-service um, possibility. It was a different type of case. And so we worked with those engineers and our leadership team and decided to exclude those the case types. And so I would have been seeing that someone was just frustrated about, about meeting the link rate and didn't like our calculation. We actually won them over and engage them more in our program by listening to them and taking action that would support behaviors. Um, because when we had that in place, we found that there were some odd behaviors that you would typically expect if you put an activity goal on, on, on a, uh, or goal on an activity, which is, you know, false, sorry, false uh, linking and uh, fake KBs as placeholders. So we were able to reduce that noise and win some of our coaches over and their participation of the program. So um, that was just one of our success stories. So 
Um, Monique, how about you? That's a great story. I, I love that, um, that you were able to win them over. And I think that's part of the key that you kind of have to address um, when we have people that kind of are resisting at times, which we'll talk about on the next slide. But I'll also include that, you know, you really need to invest in a real coaching program, um, allowing peers to focus on practices and building that into the DNA of the coaches. Because even with a successful solve loop or what you perceive as successful, because maybe one indicator is showing that, you can absolutely still improve your outcome. So for example, at a past company that I worked at, we had an organization that created a lot of knowledge articles and they were high quality and we did it well. And we, th we thought we didn't need coaches because there wasn't a lot of turnover. You know, people were staying there for 10, 20 years. There was very high seniority. The quality of the articles was high, but when we finally did implement coaching and we focused on the behaviors also within the soft loop, you know, so, you know, quality wasn't an, an issue that we really had to focus on, but we focused on those behaviors. And so I remember even just the first month, first month of the proof of, proof of concept, um, we got a 25% reduction in time to mitigation. So, you know, that's real proof that regardless of your history with KCS, coaching is a key driver and it eventually becomes the foundation of your program. Great. Thanks for that. And um, Christy, you were cutting out a little bit, so you may need to drop your video. Uh, we'll, we'll give you, a, when you're okay. speaking, we'll give you a heads up on that if that uh, continues. Um, one of the uh, questions, actually, there were several questions about how you select uh, the coaches, and you certainly talked about selecting the passionate, but there was questions on where do they come from? Are they within the support team? Are they centralized? Are they the leads in a support team? If anyone wants to handle that question. Yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, typically, what we found is that our coaches work really well when they're embedded with the support teams. So we, we tend to draw our coaching staff from the support teams that, that they're working with. Uh, they're still working on cases, so they have that direct support specialist understanding and empathy. Uh, and within the teams, they tend to be the ones that our teams are going to anyways for help with uh, solving their cases. So they, they already kind of start to bubble up as those people who are already doing the coaching work, uh, possibly just without that title. So uh, definitely embedded with the support teams. Christy, Monique, do you have uh, any differences? <laughs> no, same. And then another question, thanks for that, is the, the training. How do you ramp them up as a coach? There's certainly uh, uh, the aspect of how to do the link accuracy, the, the PAR, and the more global PAR, as well as the content standard checklist, formerly KQ, AQI. But as far as the coaching itself, how do you uh, ramp them up on being an effective coach? So we, um, we use an LMS system, and we recently, in the last couple of months, have actually created journeys um, for the knowledge worker. Um, and then a coach would assume that one as well as the coaching and then KDE has their own journey as well. And so within the coaches, it is, um, we'd expect you to know everything about being a publisher as well as we give you additional training on how to complete a link accuracy, how to do the AQIs, how to use um, advanced uh, features within our tool and look for those. And then as I mentioned, we have a monthly call and then we have um, on top of that, two weeks later, we have a calibration call. So if you are struggling or if you have some questions, you can come to that and have your peers help you with that. And for us, we, uh, we have a, a prerequisite training that is some online um, coaching and soft skill training. And then we have a, a two, hour, two hour live training session um, of a course uh, that we developed in house and we walk through scenarios. Um, we practice doing AQI together on real articles. We practice linking accuracy. They go off in teams and collaborate together. So the coaches, um, you know, try to figure this out together and we review all that soft stuff. So it's a lot of practice. Um, and then, you know, we do have um, 
the, the supporting elements that continue to upskill the coaches, the monthly calls, the, you know, spaced um, IM chats and, and all those things that kind of help keep them um, up to date. Likewise, we have a lot of uh, multi-pronged uh, attacks on, on training our coaches, coaching staff. Uh, a lot of it does come down to self-guided training uh, through our LMS as well. Uh, really great benefit to that is, is the fact that they can learn on their own time at their own pace, of course. Um, the other side of that is utilizing our coach leads to really help guide and coach the coach, if you will. Uh, that, that has been a huge benefit to us as well. And then lastly, we do uh, or should be doing, have been doing, maybe skipped a few, but we're restarting them again, uh, calibration sessions. So really sitting down with our coaching teams and going through those calibration sessions to make sure that we're all on the same page, that we're all equally reviewing as, as we go across our global teams, that one team or coach is not more or less strict than another. All right, great, thanks. And on that, uh, be agile. Oh, and, and by the way, we also have Kelly Murray on, and so you'll see some nice uh, important links from uh, Kelly. She's our chief engagement officer, so she's been uh, putting some links in the chat on uh, references to our documentation practices guide and other things. And um, we do have on the being agile, and we have a lot of great questions coming in, but let's jump to the lessons learned. So you talked about, you know, fail, fail fast. What are some of the, the lessons learned? And actually, uh, Monique, you want to lead us off on this? Sure. So um, it was interesting because when uh, we were talking, you know, as a team um, before this call, we were listing some of those items and there were a lot that were in common. So those are the ones that we, we kind of focused on for this slide. So the first one was um, don't skim on coaching, um, whether it's the sessions, the training, uh, you know, glossing over those things means that you're losing benefits and you're uh, risking adoption. So you really have to pay attention to the details and be comprehensive. And the second thing is ESP does not work. So do not expect your coaches to know what to do and how to do it, right? So um, go through the whether it's process or technology, go, go through those examples with them. Real life demos, documentation, all those things are important because you know we all know that going through, through training, you can't retain all that stuff. So having that consistent backup is important. Um, the third item is silos. So avoid letting each geo be independent or kind of veering off and having their own versions or exceptions. And so to help with that is, uh, you know, identifying a lead and, and the lead coach, like J Jason mentioned earlier, they're coached by the program owners. So now you're making sure things are consistently, you know, the same across the globe. And if there is a great idea that one geo comes up with, run it by the others and implement it globally. Uh, the fourth thing is setting and forgetting. So Plan for backfilling your coaches um, as they move on, because you will find that those that are interested in coaching, um, you definitely always want them to opt in to coaching. Um, they never want to stop growing. And so you'll find that you have to be prepared uh, to train new coaches uh, pretty quickly because, you know, they'll move on um, to become managers and, and go to other teams within the business. So having a, a process in place and having like a buddy coach handoff is, is a great uh, process to follow. And the fifth one is never stop coaching, never let it fall off the plate, even temporarily. So I've heard of organizations and I've seen some uh, that I've worked at in the past where, you know, um, because the leaders, the executive executive team didn't understand how, you know, taking time to do this really helps dig you out of that hole. Instead, they said, we're really, you know, buried. Let's let's stop coaching for, for a little bit, you know, a few months or whatever, so that we can, you know, get out of the backlog. But actually, that makes it worse. And so um, the other thing is, it also sends the message that um, it's not important to, to your operations. So make sure that it is always done and it never falls off the plate. Um, number six is don't assume engagement. So it's not a guarantee. Um, you need to inspect what you expect. So identify areas that need attention. And seven is not settling. So 
No coach is better than a poor one. And you want to remove the disruptors and fill it with somebody who really sees the value of being a coach. Again, you don't want to assign it to somebody, but instead set criteria and look for people that want to take that opportunity. And lastly, silence. So silence is not an agreement or confirmation that others understand what you're talking about. So for example, when we say, do not put goals on activities, do they understand that in the context of KCS? And what are KCS activities? So ask questions, find ways to test stakeholder knowledge and get everyone on the same page. So Christy, Jason, what do you think? Did I, did I cover that well enough? Yeah, Monique, this is spot on. Um, one of one of the things I'd love to just offer as a tip about the whole silence, right, and asking questions and making sure that people understand is someone once told me a long time ago is to count to 20, obviously quietly, right, when you ask a question, to give people who don't, um, who want to think a little bit about what you ask them and a chance to respond, and very rarely do I make it past 15 internally before someone will actually speak up. So if that's helpful to some of you, I definitely... Um, encourage trying that because sometimes we take silence as an agreement and it's not, um, it is definitely a, definitely not healthy um, sometimes. So um, the one thing I wanted to mention too is about previously we talked about resistor feedback um, is to not take it personally. So, you know, early on in my career, I would take feedback too personally as if I personally failed, you know, if we did a new workflow, if we did a new process and then, you know, it didn't work out the way that we wanted it to. Um, even if I was perfect, I would never please anyone. So, you know, when you have resistors, you have feedback for the program, don't take it personally. As I mentioned, it's definitely a continuous improvement um, process and you're always doing something to improve the program. So um, if that is helpful. Um, and, and the last one about don't assume, um, you know, I recently did some metrics on just how often activities for our coaches were being completed. And I was shocked that 30% had not done any activities in the last three months. Like, I was blown away because I assumed they come to the calls, <laughs> we do this stuff together, surely they know what to do and they, they're doing it. And so I always live by the mantra of inspect what you expect. Excellent, Christy. You know, I'd also like to point out here that uh, a conversation about resistors may seem kind of contradictory to some of the prior slides and conversations at a first glance. We absolutely should be embracing them, as you note, Christy. Uh, mm -hmm. But to Monique, to your point, there are times when it might actually be best to remove or redirect a resistant coach to a more appropriate role. You actually might find that their still skills really start to shine more as a KDE instead of as a coach or even vice versa. So balancing out these perspectives in your program and remembering that we're all working with humans who have their own needs and desires that may or may not align with our own uh, is absolutely critical here. Right. And then it's, you know, on the don't accept silence, that last part is key. And not only not accepting silence, but also be don't be silent on communicating the value that your coaching program is bringing. And we actually had some of the questions in chat. How do you measure that value? What do you measure? How do you communicate that? And uh, Christy, do you want to lead that uh, discussion on uh, that topic? Sure. So how, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's how do you, what is the benefit of this coaching program? Is it worth it? Is it worth your time? Is it worth the engineers that are investing their time? So there's a couple of things that we, um, we see as commonalities across our programs of the benefits and buy-ins. Um, and so one, um, knowledge workers who have coaches are more likely to achieve publisher status faster, right? Because they're being coached. But also there's a content velocity that happens, right? They're, they're bought in, they're, they're creating more content, um, they're engaged more in the process and that speeds up a lot of things. Um, two, engineers take more pride of contributions, so the quality gets better. And so based on how you improve, you, you monitor quality, that might be such things as your AQI scores or thumbs up or voting on articles or the comments on articles or the overall views. Thirdly, coaches are more engaged in self-service. 
and help adoption of the processes or tools in your company. Because really, they're like little, not little, but many program managers, right? So the extension of the program office, especially in a large program, you have people who are advocates and they really understand the value of self-service. So it helps accelerate any type of tool or processes rollout. Um, you know, as we mentioned, with coaches getting more engaged, there's also the upside of increased awareness about technology. Like, for instance, you know, we talk about content standards, right? General rule of thumb and KCS, but tying that to how rich snippets are displayed and why we want structured um, data really under, helps on, us all understand the value of the content standard and what its potential use is versus just doing it this way. Um, also, we have found that there's an increased um, opportunity to explain other types of technologies to coaches, like how search engines work and how it works in your company, or things like SEO and sitemaps. So that raises all of our levels together. And when issues happen, we're able to troubleshoot them faster because we're all have gotten some upskilling in how self-service tools work. Um, and lastly, I mean, I think the big one everybody wants to see is metrics, right? And <clears throat> everyone loves metrics, but, you know, things that we've all seen and, and you know, the, the, the consortium has, has lots of material on this as well is that, you know, it's just demonstrated that you do see a reduced time to close, right, or a reduced time to solve, an increase in self-service, right, and how you measure that if it's views or um, cases being deflected or cases being stopped at case creation. Um, but definitely, there's, there's this impact that happens to our support organization when customers are able to consume data and apply it to their questions. Um, and lastly, shorter time to proficiency. We even see here at Broadcom that engineers can change teams with a 60% reduced time of training because they have a mature knowledge base to draw answers from. So Monique and Jason, is there anything else that you guys would like to add to those benefits that we've seen or talked about? You're on mute, Monique. Oh, you're on mute, Monique. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, as you were speaking, it really hit me that um, content velocity and article quality, right? They they kind of feed in, they all feed in into that upskilling. So mm -hmm. the benefits really do feed into each other or build upon the previous ones. And Another example would be extracting that data and using it to identify your demand drivers to improve your products and services through problem management. So in addition to training, coaching really emphasizes the need for correct linking. So that's another you know, KPI that is valuable. And also helping your leaders see the, the entire ecosystem and how these things connect and depend on each other really helps drive that buy-in, right? Because a lot of people are asking, well, how do you get um, buy-in? You show them what the benefits are, right? And, and how everything is mapped together and depends on each other and how things move, you know, one activity might move the, the needle someplace else. And so really helping them to understand that helps them to be able to start talking about it and to support it and to give you the buy-in as well. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, we looked at was because everybody always wants to know is, well, what kind of objectives do you set? And, you know, because everyone wants to set objectives on activities. And so um, we, we really had this in-depth conversation about, well, no, we can't do that because then they're going to, you know, that's an activity. And so really what it came down to is if you focus on coaching, it addresses all of those behaviors, all of those activities, and it does it in a way that, you know, you can't re really gamify a coaching session with two people together, right? I mean, um, it, if you really just focus on what is happening in that session, all those other things, behaviors and KPIs, they will fall into place. And so to give you an example, um, you know, prior to me joining, um, the organization struggled with, you know, one coaching sessions happening, the attach rates were, were so low and the accuracy was low also. So we stopped talking about those things. And instead we just started talking about coaching and we never showed any of the other numbers or indicators. And what happened was 
We focused on coaching and naturally everything else fell into place. So it was so crazy to see like our attach rate went up, the accuracy was high, um, you know, all these other indicators um, where we just stopped talking about them and focus on the behaviors, they fell into place naturally. And so, you know, I think, you know, helping people to see that bigger picture um, is another way to kind of get the buy-in that you need. That's excellent, Monique. And likewise, I, I like to build on that idea of buy-in that I, once I've seen the uh, metrics and key performance indicators are in the ecosystem, you definitely begin to see that better adoption, but you still need both that top-down and bottom-up buy-in to really be successful. And it, I don't just mean agreement here. When I say buy-in, what I'm really talking about is even at that executive level sponsorship, that they understand the program well enough to be a champion for it just as much as our coaches are. Driving that level of buy-in is in the deep belief in the program is absolutely essential to all levels of the organization. It can't just be a one-way street. In my experience, the best way to get there is through continued one-to-one -one conversations, much like a coach would have with a specialist with your key stakeholders at all of those levels. Continuing to build those relationships across the program is where we see to continue, continue to see those greater successes along the way as well. Great. Well, thanks. And then, uh, Monique, you were in uh, chat. Uh, there was a, several about uh, do you train on technical writing, and you had a great answer. If you wouldn't mind elaborating on that. Yeah. So KCS, part of the, the principles of KCS is to you know, capture in the workflow. So you want to capture your customer context, and then you're going to reuse it in a way that is easy for others to understand, but also easy for you to write, especially when a lot of us have companies that are, you know, where we have employees all around the world and maybe English, which is usually the primary language on your support site, isn't necessarily the first language of your knowledge worker. And so the, the KCS structure teaches you to write a KB article in what is called a recipe format. So usually, you know, you have a, a very distinct, you know, title, um, and then you have your description or, or your symptoms listed in bullet points. And you capture all of that in complete thoughts, not complete sentences. So it's kind of like reading um, instructions on how to put a piece of furniture together, right? It's not knowing how to be, you know, some beautiful English major that writes, you know, poetry and books. Um, it's just very complete thoughts like, you know, select a button ABC to enable software. Right, and you don't have to add all those extra words, and so that with your um, your symptoms, and then you add on to them as customers keep adding additional ways of describing it, um, and then the steps are numbered one through five, one through ten, whatever they are, right? And so again, it's very easy to read. It's standalone, one item per article. So then, in your steps, if you have something that is really, you know, like maybe it's step one, enable administ administration mode. Well, you don't wanna go into a whole, you know, paragraph on how to do that. And the, a great piece would be to link to another article that tells you how to do that because that's a standalone procedure. And so that is the structure that we teach all of our knowledge workers to follow. And when you do the content standard checklist, there are important key items that the coach looks at in comparison to the article to make sure it's following that standard. All right, thank you for that. And then another question um, regarding PAR, you had, uh, you all talked about link accuracy and are any of your coaches also looking for create opportunities and modify opportunities? I know yeah. certainly link accuracy is the low hanging fruit to start with, but I'm just curious if you, yeah, absolutely, Arnfin. We uh, we we definitely uh, check the content uh, content standard checklist and, and par for those missed opportunities for either uh, reuse, uh, creating new, or modifying as well. Uh, it it's probably one of the the biggest pieces to our our par checklist, our, our content standard checklist. Uh, they kind of roll into to each other in uh, in our review method. So. Yeah, and I think Jason, um, I've been to your point, like the low hanging fruit, I think 
we just reintroduced this into our tool, into our tool and I think the low hanging fruit or the easier part is the reuse and the create. Um, the improve is definitely, I think, something that's a little bit more um, involved or it takes a little bit more skill to be able to do that. So if you're studying like what we're doing is really trying to make sure that um, that low hanging fruit or just basic behaviors is there and then on the improve, which might be a little bit more challenging to assess uh, initially. Cool. I'm not sure if Jason and Monique, if you have, I know you have a, a longer standing history of your tools. Um, I'm actually in, mi in the middle of uh, shifting our uh, improve methodology and strategy uh, to actually utilize our Salesforce tooling now to better support a flag it, fix it type program. So uh, definitely knee deep in the middle of uh, figuring out that strategy and moving that forward. And I missed part of that, part of the, the question, but based off the, what you guys were answering, one of the things that we do is during uh, link accuracy checks, if somebody, the, the coach has the option, besides saying, yes, it's accurate and no, it's not, the coach has the option to say, this is a modification loss, um, or this is a reuse loss or a creation loss. And so then we get a report to see, you know, what percentage um, fall in those buckets and, you know, then we kind of target where we need to focus, you know, additional training um, and attention. Great. And then also I, actually, for, oh, Arnson, I want to, I want to step in because uh, Monique, you, you really hit something that I, I like it, it in our process. We have the ability of course, to mark, mark off for AQI or par in the checklist. We also give our coaches the opportunity to identify those points where we might have missed, but not necessarily mark off for that, just create a coaching opportunity, have that conversation, uh, especially for our newer specialists who are coming in, who might not be as familiar. Uh, we give them that opportunity to continue to train in uh, and coach in some of those uh, processes before we really start marking them off in the KPIs. Great. And then one of the, the challenges that we see in many organizations is distinguishing from a assisted article versus a solved article. And we see many coaches accidentally say, oh, this was accurate, but it was actually not a solved. It was assisted, but they didn't have enough technical expertise to determine that. Any guidance for the audience there? Well, in our world, it's pretty easy to, to tell the difference just by even looking at the title. Um, you know, is it a general troubleshooting, you know, linking to other articles, kind of almost like a decision tree kind of thing, or is it just really focused on one topic with a solution? Yeah, we're definitely focused more heavily on uh, one topic and solution, uh, one resolution attached to the case. Uh, I, I am working on uh, some deeper strategy as well because I am so new to Autodesk. Uh, a lot of my, my work so far has just been heavily strategic and not actually implementing quite yet. Um, but we're definitely looking at uh, the ability to attach not only a solution article, but what we're calling or what I'm calling a reference article or an assist article. Yeah, so we actually have that um, with ours um, and we have the ability to mark whatever article was the resolution. Um, so that way, if you did link a reference article, what we evaluate you on the link accuracy will only be the resolution. So those are something that we're working towards too as well. Okay, great. And then we do have, I think we covered almost all of the, uh, I mean, there's some uh, detailed questions for individual panelists that we will, um, again, we're gonna be, actually creating a Google Doc for the panelists of the chat. And what we're gonna do is have all the, the panelists go in and answer. And uh, if it's just specifically for them, they'll give that answer. But if it's to the panel as a whole, they'll all put in their thoughts. So you will see that coming out shortly. And we're actually um, gonna be, we're pretty close to timing out. So why don't we just go ahead and um, just close this. And what we'd like to do though, if you could, the panel discussion, we had one last week and that was uh, very popular. And again, hopefully that you like this one also. If there are additional um, 
topics that you'd like to have panel discussions on, if you could put those in chat also, that would be very helpful. And um, we'll go ahead and start arranging for that. And again, if you are interested in uh, uh, participating in a panel, we'd love to hear that. I mean, we're really trying to tap into the collective wisdom of this broader community. So the more we can share those. And we really want to thank the panelists. So it was not just, uh, as you can see from the presentation, it was not just uh, an ad hoc, but there was a lot of um, many meetings uh, going into this. And actually, I think you all found a lot of value because you got to explore each other's programs and, and share best practices in the process. So, um, but want to really thank you all. And we will have as a, um, a byproduct this presentation. So we'll not only send out the recording, but the presentation. And again, we'll also uh, do our best on the chat log and getting answers there. So thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. And um, hopefully we'll see you at the next KCS in action. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Yeah, thank you.